Welcome to this year's Nyman Ranch 22nd Annual Hog Farmer Appreciation Celebration. This is one of the final events today with a farmer panel. I'm very excited to be here today. My name is Delaney Howell and I will be moderating this one of this final events here for Nyman Ranch's annual celebration. I currently work as the Chief Marketing Officer for Trader PhD in Agricultural marketing company, as well as host a daily podcast called Ag News Daily, which covers the gamut of agricultural topics. You may also recognize me as the former host of Iowa Public Television's Market to Market program. And I also have a very special connection to Nyman Ranch. For about 10 years, my family raised Nyman Ranch production hogs and sold through the Nyman Ranch system. And I'm also one of the former Nyman Ranch Next Generation Foundation scholarship winners. So Nyman Ranch has definitely made a huge impact on my life and holds a special place in my heart. But this is one of the coveted events I think that a lot of you have been tuning in and waiting for because we have a great lineup of panelists to talk about their experiences raising for Nyman Ranch. But before we get to that, an introduction of those panelists, I have just a few housekeeping items I want to cover with everyone. This is one of the final events for this year's six week program with Nyman Ranch. So to learn more about the Hog Farmer Appreciation Celebration and for those few final events, you can visit the website nymanranchhfad.com. There's about two more events open to the public. We've got some great remarks coming from animal welfare expert, Dr. Temple Grandin this evening and a virtual farm tour hosted tomorrow at noon central standard time. And I believe led by one of our very own panelists. We also want to encourage that during this panel, we're going to be taking some questions from our audience. So if you have any questions, go ahead and chat those in the chat function. And we'll be trying to weave those into discussions as well as leaving about 15 minutes at the end of this panel today to tackle some of those great questions that I'm sure we're gonna get from our audience members. And lastly, we hope that you'll entertain and interact with us on social media. You can use the hashtag NRFarmer2020 if you want to share any tidbits or things that you're learning from today's panel, please use that hashtag for us. So now I'm very excited without further ado to introduce today's panelists and I'm not gonna give too much of their bios away. I'd like them to do that for themselves, but we have a really great lineup of diversified farmers joining us today. First off, I'll start here with Joel Gindo, who is from Brookings, South Dakota, but was originally born and raised on a small diversified farm in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, before moving to Iowa to attend Wartburg College and later finish up with his MBA. We also have Leslie Christensen joining us from Harlan, Iowa. She farms with her husband, but was not grown or grew up on a farm. She actually grew up in Guatemala and later came to the United States at about six years old, married David and was just thrown right into the farming life, it sounds like. And so her and David raised their two children on the farm. And I'll allow Leslie to share a little bit more about her background coming up. We also have veteran farmer Ron Martison, who lives in Elliott, Iowa, where he farms and is a field agent for Nyman Ranch. So very long standing history with the company. And you may recognize Ron for his cameo appearance in the Chipotle Rose Bowl Parade commercial and uh, writing on that float. And then certainly last but not least, we have David Barrowman, who lives outside of Kansas City with his wife and two children raising Nyman Ranch hogs. but he had a long stint away from the farm to begin with. About 15 years or 17 years, he took a hiatus away from the farm where he attended college and worked as a wildlife biologist for the USDA. He came back to the farm with just 15 Berkshire pigs and has grown into a really diverse operation. David, I'm excited for you to share more about your operation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, David, to share just a quick tweet about your operation and uh, how you got involved with Nyman ranch well we started uh like you said with just a few Berkshire pigs to sell to mostly friends and family um i was still working part-time at the time and and started growing our farming operation and we were just looking for that last piece of the puzzle to where i could farm full-time and it, when you're when you raise your own your own animals to to sell uh yourself um uh, 
there's a lot of time and commitment and and finding the markets for those and uh, scaling up is, is always an issue. And so uh, when we we kind of knew about Nyman and then when we found they were still looking for farmers, we got a hold of the field and they came out and, and basically the way we were raising the hogs, the way that we believe hogs should be raised fit right in line with the Nyman protocols. Um, and it gave us a chance to sort of wholesale and scale up uh, pretty quick. And that became the last piece of the puzzle. So um, I've been farming full time for about the last two years and uh, loving every minute of it. Joel and Leslie, you both have very interesting backgrounds as well, coming from different countries and then immersing yourself into the U.S. agricultural system. Leslie, I'll start with you and then turn it over to you, Joel. But tell me about your experience coming to the United States, starting to work and, and own farms and what Nyman Ranch did for your farms. Well, we definitely <laughs> didn't know anything about farming when I um, when I came to the States. Um, my parents, even though we lived in Iowa, didn't I didn't know anything. So when I met my husband, he definitely showed me all the ropes. Um, and then with Nyman Ranch, we've definitely um, diversified like that. And we have been loving it so far. And Joe, yeah. what are you yeah, sorry. Well, for me, uh, it has been a fun experience. I didn't know anything about pigs. Actually, my friend Ben, uh, when I moved to Brookings, he raised pigs there with his wife, Kaylee, and uh, I was just starting to help them when they're out of town. And he told me uh, a little bit about Neiman uh, later on. But uh, I grew up, we had dairy cows and chicken, basically almost everything, uh, but we never had pigs. So I started raising pigs and I was uh, selling at the farmer's market in direct just around Brookings area and Sioux Falls. And I got to the point I kind of, like Dave say, I wanted to uh, scale up and do more and find a customer that can raise more pigs and, and the customer that appreciates that uh, value the way we raise our pigs and livestock. And uh, I talked to Ben and then he told me more about uh, Neiman Ranch. So. And then uh, four years later, here I am today. So it's been exciting. Yeah. Ron, I'm going to pick on you for a second. How many years have you been raising for Nyman? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you said for Nyman Ranch, not just <laughs> raising. But uh, I sold my first pigs to Nyman Ranch in April of 2002. So I passed 18 here a couple months ago. But but my story is a little bit different in everybody else's in that I'm I am the uh, fifth generation on this particular farm. And we have always had a philosophy that we would walk the grain off of the farm. In other words, you know, we, we would feed it through the livestock and then it would leave the farm that way. Um, in the 90s, as things began to change, it became harder and harder and harder for us. And by us, I mean the Martison family to generate enough revenue on the farm. So we began to look for a different alternative to market our livestock. See, the, the theme at home has always been that we believe that the animals should be animals. They should exhibit their own natural behaviors. And that we, pigs could be pigs, for instance. And I uh, read about Paul Willis and Nyman Ranch in a news, um, an, excuse me, in a magazine article in about 1999, uh, 98, excuse me, 1998. And I decided, I, I, I don't know, I think we're okay. Then of course, anybody with any amount of history knows what happened to the, the pig market in the fall of 1998. I say fall because it not only was the time of year, but it also was a perfect description of what happened. A lot of equity left the Midwest via the depressed market. So after that, I pursued Nyman Ranch and uh, I have not looked back. That's a really great story, Ron. And I'm gonna turn it back to you because we also mentioned at the, off the top of the conversation here that you're also a field agent. So I think you are probably one of the most qualified folks to tell us a little bit more about the Nyman Ranch model. Okay, I'd be glad to. I, I am no longer the field agent. They put the old white haired guy out to pasture, <laughs> but I still get to run around and pester the field agents. Nyman Ranch is unique in that they, they want the farmers to succeed. They wanna make sure that, that, that not only um, um, they care for their farmers and they, they care for the pigs as well. And they have instilled a group of, of very professional individuals they call field agents and each field agent uh, helps between 55 and 60 farmers he visits with them weekly uh, he or she goes to the farm at least four times a year and he or she is is educated and instructed and taught 
to help the farmers with any technical issues they have, with any any questions they have. They also help them do the marketing. They also help them uh, find seed stock. They also help them find uh, feed, what feed companies, et cetera, stuff like that to use. That really sets Nyman Ranch apart from the rest of the, the, uh, the rest of the competition we have. They care about their farmers and they have field agents is just one example in one way that they do. Leslie, I see you nodding your head a lot. So I'm going to direct this question towards you. But what Ron is essentially alluding to is there is just a big network of folks that use the Nyman Ranch system. There's field agents to support you. How has that aspect helped your business there on your farm? Oh my goodness. When we started, um, we were already raising hogs the Nyman Ranch way, but um, we didn't have uh, like the specifics, you know, or like tweaking it here and there. And Ron was our field agent then. He gave us so many ideas. He's like, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And it helped so much. So I am thankful for those field agents that come here and just help us succeed. Yeah. Definitely. And speaking of trying new things, I know a lot of you have the Nyman Ranch system implemented on your farms, but you know, especially you, David, you do a lot of unique things when it comes to sustainability, to raising other crops and livestock. I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. We're probably uniquely situated in just about 20 miles north of downtown Kansas City. So we have some good opportunities for some value added products. And so um, this year we're raising some heirloom corn. Some of that's going to a local distillery and some of it is going to a tortilla factory for uh, red and green tortillas. Um, we still keep our herd of Berkshire hogs that we sell at farmers markets and direct to the public. And we haul hay. There's a lot of people with horses around here. And so we do square bales and, and deliver hay all winter. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I don't know. Like I say, anything to make a buck around here. And, and uh, the, so we just do uh, wheat to finish, which is nice. And Ron mentioned earlier, he's just getting into this fall farrowing. And, and we have about 100 acres of row crop as well. And, and you know, it's from when I grew up, it's like you don't want pigs hitting the ground at the same time the, the beans seem to be coming out. And so having that option to just be weaned to finish and big pigs sort of, you know, on a schedule when you know they're going to come and, and being able to work around our other, our other operations on the farm is, is nice. There's never a dull moment, right? No. <laughs> David, um, I'm going to come back to you because I want to dig into that a little bit deeper. You've got a really unique background, but Joel, you also have a really diversified farm and you had a diversified farm back home in Dar es Salaam before you came to the United States. Tell us a little bit more about that operation. Uh, well, before I moved here, my parents, we had dairy cows. It was just a small, uh, I think at that, some point, the maximum we had maybe 15, 20, but uh, we also had chickens and ducks and rabbits. We had goats. And we had a big garden. Uh, my parents, both of them, walked in town. So this was, we just live a little bit out of town and we do all this. So in the morning, we wake up, do the milking the cows. And then my mom will put us in our vehicle, we'll go to school and come back in the evening and do it again. It was just kind of like that. Uh, then I went to, I left, I went to college and, and uh, my parents now, they don't do any cows anymore. But <laughs> once we're all gone, my dad say, well, we're done, but I kept on when I moved here, when I finished college, uh, uh, when I was in college, I helped with other farmers, uh, uh, just doing corn and soybean and other things they need. Uh, but right now, when I moved to Brookings, I started raising chickens and uh, pigs, so I do poultry and uh, broilers. And so, for example, my laying hands, I build a portable shelter that I moved them on the pasture, and also I had broilers to the portable shelter and I moved with following laying hens and uh, also I have farrowing to finish so I farrow my own pigs and I raise the pig list to market. Uh, usually when the pigs, pigs are a little smaller I used to move them you know I move them to on the on the pasture until they're about two months then I put them somewhere else they have access to go outside. Uh, uh, so that's kind of a little bit what I do now. I sell directly to our customer in Brookings, the farmer's market. Uh, and I do some uh, Sioux Falls around this area. And I also sell to Neiman. 
And so a lot of you have components of your operation that are focused on sustainability, which is definitely a hot button word right now. When you look at your own operations, David and, and Joel, you've alluded to it a little bit here, but how does sustainability dictate what you do on both the Nyman Ranch side of things and just your operation in general? Leslie, I see you nodding along there. So I'll direct this first one to you. Um, well, we definitely want to give our land um, or leave it or even make it better uh, for our kids. Um, we, what we do is we use cover crops and we do no-till. Um, we also feed our corn to our hogs and our cows. And then um, once it comes out, it goes back to the land. So um, we, that's how we do it around here. Uh, how about you, David? Yeah, um, we're the same. I've uh, when I started row cropping three years ago, I started with uh, just a tractor and no-till drill, and my goal is to never own a piece of tillage equipment um, to continue no-till. Uh, we try to put a cover crop on every acre that we farm, and it actually works out really nice. We run cattle in the winter, um, either through custom grazing or if we buy them, um, they gain really well, and I think there's a soil benefit to that as well. Um, with the hogs, uh, we do, if they're outside, we do rotational grazing. Um, I thought I was the only person that did rotational grazing with hogs until I joined nine and now other people doing hogs outside. Um, and, uh, but specifically to sustainability, um, we look at it not just as an environmental issue, but, but, uh, sort of just for the longevity of the farm and, and you look at sustainability as like a, a three-legged stool and sort of the farm is the seat and we have environmental sustainability where we want to leave the land or as you know better than, than we got it. Uh, we look at it as a community responsibility. And so um, I say it's not, it's not easy uh, to be the neighbor of a pig farm, but, but uh, we, we work with our neighbors and we always tell them, if you can smell our pigs, tell us because that means we're doing something wrong. It's not something that the pigs are doing. It's our management. And it's a really good relationship with our neighbors. <clears throat> and then the last thing is, is, is profitability. And uh, a farm can't continue to lose money forever. Uh, so profitability has to be one of those, those aspects of, of sustainability. And Nyman is definitely, has been in the last two years, the most profitable aspect of farm. And, and with low crop prices, it's, it's sort of uh, propped up uh, the row crop side, and we're working the transition like Ron into to walking every every kernel of corn off our farm, and that's why we're expanding our hog operation. And, and uh, so, just the hogs sort of have a cascading effect down the farm to, to make other things work. It makes your to you know use on more things. It makes your trailer not just for this, but you can use it for the hogs and and uh, so it's, uh, it's just been, been a really great addition to the farm. And, and I'm, I agree with, with Dave and Leslie. Uh, you know, for me, when I think about sust sustainable farm, uh, uh, it's just the one that meets, you know, the, the current and the future needs, and not only for just environment, but also for human needs. Just my feedback, for example, I got the farmer's market, most people now, they are more aware, they're looking for more healthy products and they, they, they start, well, how do you raise your animal? And uh, so I, I see that, you know, well, this is, people are start want to care more now about these things. And, uh, and talking about environment, for example, uh, when lazy say, you know, you, you take a place, you leave it and then better than you found it before. Uh, uh, for example, my broilers, when I have those, that portable shelter and then, Every day I move them to a new area. The area that they were there the day before, of course, they, they ate all the grass and they, the manure there, and I moved them. When I come back two months later, that area that I moved them two months ago, the grass has grown up. You can just see it's nice and green. And, and that's for me, it's like that's sustainable. You have those uh, flexible the animal have the health, healthy environment for them to grow up. And in, at the end, we have a healthy product. And also uh, for us, when we get something that's healthy, of course, we are healthier too. So that's kind of how I 
for me, that's I see that's that's sustainable. I I I think when I think of sustainability, and I think of Nyman Ranch. Um, a long time ago, I heard a quote, and it said, um, "We come and we go, but the land is always here, and the people who who love it." and understand it are the people who own it at least for a little while so i think what you've heard from these other three is that they know it they love it and they understand it um we all have have a, a vision of a future in mind uh, whether it be our children or someone to take the land over from us and every one of us have a goal that we want to leave it better than we found it uh in the nyman system we're lucky enough that we use um uh, either pastures or deeply bedded pens and both are excellent ways of rejuvenating the soil with with the natural manures that we put back on it. Um, Nyman farmers are, are diversified. I think you've probably already picked up on that and you have seen that with what everybody's talking, whether it be boilers or whether it be, be cattle or whether it be sheep or whether it be whatever. And that is one thing that's kind of unique in this day and age. We aren't hemmed in or wedged in to, to a monoculture view on agriculture. We're uh, scrappers, for lack of a better way to describe it. We think outside the box. We're not afraid to work and we're willing to try new things and different things with the end goal of, of uh, preserving and protecting what we've already got. But, but David hit the nail square on the head when he said it has to be profitable or it's not going to work. Um, the thing I like about being a Nyman Ranch farmer, and I discovered this way, way, way back in the first when I first started working with them. Once I became a Nyman Ranch farmer, I don't have to worry about how I'm marketing the pigs. Diamond Ranch is doing that for me so I can concentrate on what I want to do and what I'm good at. And honestly, that's raising the pigs. If I put 100% into that and I give all of my effort and all of my energies tied up into that, that can benefit the pigs as well as me because I know the end product is going to be used and it's going to be marketed through Diamond Ranch. Yeah, that's such a great point, Ron. I think a lot of farmers you know, in more monoculture systems lose the value or lose the time that they get to spend actually producing their crops and livestock because they have to worry about what's the market going to do tomorrow. And Nyman Ranch helps kind of remove some of that risk for you guys, really. You, st you stop and think, well, let's, let's, let's go back to what we've been through already. And maybe you were going to talk about this a little later on. We heard the horror stories of, of farmers not being able to to uh, get their pigs to market. And we heard the horror stories of what farmers had to do with a lot of the pigs that they could not move. But in the Nyman system, because of its size, because of its ability to pivot on a dime, if you will, because it's a little bit smaller, because it's a little bit more, more versatile, we were not interrupted one bit. I had a, a conversation uh, with, uh, with uh, CBS Morning News here during the height of this, and they were asking me what I was gonna do or how I was, was I having trouble getting my pigs to town and what I was doing and, and said, no, 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 I sell through Nyman and it went off without a hitch, without a hiccup. And they weren't interested in my story then. So it never made the news. But you know what? I'm kind of happy for that. I'm proud that I sell to Nyman and I'm proud that they could take all the pigs when they did. Absolutely. So I want to switch tracks here a little bit. You guys have all talked a lot about resources, especially when it comes to having resources to be able to farm, to pass down to the next generation. But, you know, Joel, you in particular have an interesting story coming to the U.S., buying farm ground or, or buying the ability to raise hogs and broilers and all that you do. Uh, we have a question here, so I'm going to kind of combine this guest question along with the uh, with a resource question, but when you look at resources that Nyman Ranch has to offer, what things besides field agents are there available for you to be able to learn the training that you do to raise the hogs how you do? And then, you know, in your case, Joel, what resources were there available to help you with coming into another country and being able to develop a system that was probably a little different than yours that you were used to? <clears throat> well, I will say, you know, I've had really good support since I came here. That's, I mean, I cannot forget the people that helped me out when I started out. Uh, I talked a little bit about my friend, Ben, who basically kind of helped tell me what I need to know about pigs. And also uh, 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 Jim in Brookings that uh, was willing to let me rent some of his land to kind of get me started. So that was, I mean, those are the people that just the beginning when I started because it's just coming to this country, you know, no, no land, you don't have anything to, it's just, just me. And I just come out of college and I will, I know I love being out. I would like to, to farm. And these are the people that really helped me to get me started 
to get me where I am today. And uh, joining Neiman, Ra Neiman Ranch, uh, Neiman Ranch, uh, you know, like you say, the field agents really help us. I was still kind of learning at that time with pigs and I really liked the opportunity that I know, you know, if something happened, someone will be on the phone call, I can call them and I know I've had phone call, hey, I have something going on. And that was really helpful, helpful to start. And I was raising pigs before, you know, the way Neiman Ranch wanted, raise them outside and uh, 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 follow everything that I need to do for Neiman. Uh, but the field agents, there's something that comes up, I can call them when they are, they are always there ready to help me when you have a question. Uh, also, yeah, I really being able to sell to Neiman also helped me kind of scale, really being able to scale, like, uh, like Ron said, uh, now I don't have to worry about where I'm going to market those pigs. I really appreciate it. I can focus with going out and just focus on raising pigs. And uh, that has been a good experience for me. Definitely. David, what about you? One of the first things I noticed was when I started raising pigs here, uh, there are no veterinarians uh, that do much with pigs in this area. There's probably parts up in Iowa where there's a lot of hogs that, that vets do, but I think a lot of the big hog companies probably have in-house vets and stuff like that. And so <clears throat> I was asking, I called all our local vets, you know, hog questions and they're like, well, we don't really do pigs. And, and, uh, that was one of the things that really um, tipped me towards Nyman was that they have a, an in-house vet and, and uh, I can take a picture, shoot them a text, um, you know, give them a call. They've been out to the farm before. And uh, it, that was sort of some peace of mind for me because I thought, what if I have some big issue, you know, who am I going to get to help me? And uh, I know that supports it there. And most of the questions be handled by the field agents because they've seen just about everything and and if they're not sure they they push it on up to the vet and um so that's been that's been a nice nice uh benefit to, to being with nyman another thing that i've loved about nyman ranch is that um quarterly they have a farmer like meeting where they update us on everything plus they also send a newsletter so they let you know what's happening in the company what and we read that all the time plus there's videos on their websites there's um i think somebody asked about if there's like a program isn't there one ron i believe there is one where um they partner a younger farmer with an older farmer am i correct on that one? We're starting that. That's a that's a new yes, program we're starting. It's a new yeah. program that we're going to start. Mm -hmm. I read about it and I thought that was spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That the the thing getting back to the Nyman uh, vet and and not so much the vet, but all the resources that they have available. What I really like is is yeah, there are a lot of vets in Iowa. There's a lot of hog vets in Iowa. The problem is they don't understand um, dirt pigs or pigs that are raised like ours, either outside or in deeply bedded pens. So Nyman saw the need and they actually hired a vet. To, to deal specifically with those issues. And another thing I'll add, I am lucky enough that uh, my son, Michael, who's going to take the farm over when I'm done with it, is actually a vet. And I am tickled to death because he's one of those dirt hog vets. And I feel very, very fortunate that we've got him available to us. But I'll, I'll put a plug in for the Next Generation Scholarships. Uh, he's a recipient of that. And if it were not for the efforts of everybody that contributes to that, and if it were not for the efforts of Diamond Ranch, Mikey might not be where he is today. So thank you to guys. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I had quite a few friends in college that were Nyman Ranch uh, farmers as well that have received that scholarship and I also did. So it definitely goes a long way. Nyman Ranch, I think, goes a long way to, to supporting the family aspect of farming. And you've all mentioned that. But Leslie, you also have a family that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. You do a lot on social media, sharing that story, and your kids are very involved in your operation. But you also do a lot on the social media side of things to get involved with the customers. Tell us, I know you've got a few stories up your sleeve. Tell us a story or two about you know working with your kids, the challenges I'm sure that come along with that, but also working with customers through your platforms. Well, um, we 
recently, um, the kids actually partnered up with um, a store called La Bonds, and they actually got six gilt to raise as their own. And so they've been learning so much and they have to take care of them before school and after school. And um, it, in social media, I just kind of show like how the kids are learning like when the mamas are farrowing and um, just, it, we absolutely love when when we're farrowing. So um, just they are going to grow and learn. They have this opportunity that most kids don't. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, but for the customers, I just, they absolutely, I get messages all the time. Oh my goodness, I've never seen something like that. Or um, I, I was afraid you weren't gonna show that. I'm so glad. I've never seen that. I've never been on a farm. And that's kind of how I, I didn't know any of that. E even the little things that I might have thought that I think now, oh, that's not important. Somebody out there is like, oh, whoa, that's that's cool. So I love, I love, um, I love sharing that. Yeah, because farming is not a nine to five job. You all have families, they all have school and activities and all these things going on. How do you balance all of that and, and honor your commitment to raising for the Nyman Ranch system while also honoring a commitment, you know, to your families and everything else you have going on. Ron, I know, I know you've got a lot going on, so we'll start with you. Well, I, I, I feel uh, I'm on the, the downhill slope of this because everybody else is what I call in the kill zone right now with with the children pulling them 150 directions and the farms pulling them 150 directions and, and uh, Denise and I are, are not quite as thick, but, but it, it's a labor of love. I, I, you know, when you live where you work, which a lot of us do, you actually work where you live. So a lot of it is, is, is done. You don't even realize you do it. And, and I've always been under the impression, if you want something done, give it to the busiest person, you know, and I think each and every one of us on this panel falls into that category. I mean, um, yeah, you burn the candle at both ends sometimes and it gets absolutely hairy and you pull your hair out and you think, no way am I gonna make it through this. But at the end of the day, you raise an awesome set of kids, you pound an awesome work ethic into them, you give them an incredible amount of integrity and pride and you look back and say, this was worth it and man, am I glad I did it. David and Leslie, what you you guys are kind of on the other end of things with uh, just starting to raise kids and have them on the farm and maybe at the beginning of your your life, whereas Ron maybe towards the end of of his cycle with raising kids on the farm. But how how has that impacted what you do day to day? Just uh, try to get them involved as much as possible, and so they see it as sort of work and and uh, that's something they want to do and go with you. Um, my son asked for a buddy seat, so the small seat goes next to the tractor seat for his day. And uh, that, <laughs> it, well, that almost choked me up because that, that told me he wanted to be with dad in the tractor, that he was tired of bouncing around sitting on the armrest anyway. And, and uh, so you know, he's sick, so he's old enough to go with dad. And, and uh, our daughter, she always wants to go feed the piggies, and she's two. Um, so she can't come with as much, but uh, it, it, it does get busy. Um, we have good family support. Luckily, my wife's parents live a couple miles down the road, and, and they're super, super helpful. Um, and so, and then they farm, so they understand those challenges. And, and uh, so it just, it, it brings the family closer together and, and keeps that extended family kind of involved. And, and uh so I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change it for anything. I want to go. I want to intersect intersect something on what what Dave was talking about. He brought that little boy of his up to my farm. Uh, was it about a month ago, David? And uh, we went out and we ate afterwards. And for a six year old, I was absolutely floored how much he knew about different tractors. He was asking me literally about every tractor I had. He was even asking about one out in the middle of the field that I forgot that I had. So <laughs> that little boy is going to be a tractor nut. I'm sorry. I'm done. Go ahead, Leslie. <laughs> no, same. Our kids just absolutely have learned so much. They definitely work really hard. And then even when they have play dates, um, 
it's chore time and they're like, okay, um, get, get your boots on. You're going to go help me. And so they're like, you have to do this. Yeah, we have to do this every day. So it's, um, even when we're uh, harvesting, they're in the combine and tractor reading their books or their homework, doing their homework, things like they are just very involved. And I am, I, I love that part of it. I think we've had a lot of folks tuning into these uh, events that are, you know, from all specters of life. We've got chefs, grocery store owners, you know, people in the food chain side of things. We've also got farmers and fellow Nyman Ranch folks. But what messages do you have to share with them about, you know, their support for how Nyman Ranch has helped you or, or their support for continuing you on in this system? Joel, what do you, what do you think about that? Well, well, the first thing I want to say, you know, uh, I want to thank for their support to Neiman Ranch because to me, you know, they support Neiman Ranch uh, in return, you know, that helped the farmers too because when they support the Neiman Ranch, that helped the farmer, supports us too. So, uh, so that's, I want to say, I want to appreciate that they keep following us and uh, supporting Neiman Ranch. Uh, uh, and I also want to uh, thanks Nima Ranch for also uh, uh, helping us, the farmer, providing all these opportunities for us to be able to do what we love, uh, uh, providing, like you say, you know, field agents and all these things that can help the farmer to succeed, which is which has been uh, talking just for my experience, which is has helped me a lot just to get to where I want to be. So uh, uh, I want to thanks all the support. I will support Nima Ranch. Uh, because their support really help supports the farmers too. I was floored last year with my first hog farmer appreciation dinner in Iowa. And uh, when uh, we saw the businesses that, that are our customers, um, I think that night they raised almost $50,000 and gave away about $150,000 in scholarships to farmers' kids, I mean farmers' kids. And uh, my wife and I just looked at each other and were like, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't need to rely on a sports scholarship. We got to keep these kids interested in hog farming. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but to see that support, it was just sort of surreal, you know, growing up on a hog farm, on a dirt hog farm. And, and to see, you know, people from Chipotle and Butcher Box and and Marzix and and you know national brands that I knew that that were there and, and the hog farmers were the guests of honor at this dinner and and uh, it just it just floored me and so um, when when COVID hit and and they started struggling you know, we started looking at nine ways to give back to them because. Because uh, we couldn't do what we do without them. We couldn't raise hogs the way we want to, you know, feel like hogs should be raised without them. And, and uh, so, um, and Nyman, I think, has stepped up to, to try to support those businesses in this tough time, the, the restaurants and especially. And, and uh, so it, it does feel like one big family, you know, from, from the hog farmers all the way up, you know, to, to the restaurants or the chefs. Um, and I think, you know, they're, they're relying on us to create a great product and, and we're relying on them to, to make it into something special. And, and uh, so it's just, it's just an amazing sort of community is, is what I call it. That one hit me really hard, David. I'm not going to lie. That was it. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, I'm very passionate about agriculture. It's very apparent that all of you are. And that one gave me some goosebumps. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, not to get too serious here, but I saved a, a harder question, I think, for last, because the reality of agriculture and farming is that it's it's tough. You know, it's a hard business to balance everything. You've got to have a high tolerance for risk management in a lot of instances, and you have to be able to make it through those tough years to recognize that there are good years coming, you know, and, and with that, we've seen over the last, you know, five, six years, agriculture has been through a little bit of a rough cycle. And we've seen, you know, farmers losing their farms or having to get out of the operation because they're not profitable. And a couple of stark statistics here I wanted to just share, and I think it really sets the gravity of this situation, but about 52 farmers lose their farms each day in America. 
and about 56% of farms lost money in 2017. I think that statistic is expected to probably worsen a little bit here in 2020. And you know, not only that, but we're going through a big shift right now in demographics with about 70% of family farms changing hands over the next 15 years. Ron, I know you're in that boat probably within the next 15 years, having to pass it on to the next generation. But thinking about those statistics and the Nyman Ranch model, and just in general, what changes do we need to see as an industry to reverse these trends? Ron, I'll start with you. Okay, good. Um... Yes, I am. Thank you very much for pointing that out. To, to say that to say that farming is is stressful is an understatement. I tell people when I started farming, I didn't have a gray hair in my head. <laughs> You've got okay. a couple now. Yeah, I've got I've got I've got one or two. I've got one or two. <laughs> um, uh, agriculture as a whole has to shift. I mean, I mean, we've heard we've heard uh, people talk about it, and those of you that are going to tune in tomorrow night to to listen to or tonight to listen to Temple Grandin, you will probably hear it again. Uh, big isn't necessarily better. Um, what we have seen with the whole COVID nightmare is that smaller and the ability to pivot, the ability to turn and flexibility has been more of an advantage. Um, we are going to have to uh, diversify. The, the whole, all your eggs in one basket is going to have to leave. It's going to have to evaporate. We're going to have to understand that, that maybe dual purpose breeds aren't a nasty, nasty, nasty thing anymore. We're going to have to evaluate and understand that that uh, variable traits from variable different different avenues uh, can generate more revenue for us and translate into more stability for us. Um, you know, farming has never been a nine to five job. And I think over the course of the last 15, 20 years, we have tried to, to wedge it into that. Um, Farming is a job where, number one, you have to be willing to work your fanny off. I mean, we've all heard the phrase sweat equity, and we know about sweat equity. Anybody that has started from scratch understands that that's, that's what it takes. I mean, Edison himself said that, that success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And I think we're going to have to embrace that and come back to that. Um, 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 uh, there again, we need to emphasize and we need to push and we need to explore more of the value added products. Um, don't be afraid to think outside the box. I, I think we are in an incredibly uh, awesome and potential time in, in the history of agriculture, but they, as specifically in the history of this country. I mean, look and see, we have got consumers all of a sudden that not only care about where their food is coming from, but they wanna know how it's prepared. They wanna know how it's raised and they wanna know the nutritional value of it. They aren't grubbing for the, the, the cheapest slice of bread they can in the market anymore. People are worried about their health. They're worried about the consequences of the environment. And they're worried about the ultimate long run and efficiency of the farmers who are generating that. With this as a backdrop, I think if you're willing to work, if you're willing to think outside the box, and you're willing to embrace new ideas and, and, uh, and uh, new directions, this is an absolute awesome time. You stop and realize that, that the average farmer in America today is pushing 60. Hello, I'm the average farmer in America. The average Nyman Ranch farmer is at least 15 years younger than that. That tells you right there the, the, the kind of attitude, the kind of focus that Nyman Ranch has. We're all about the next generation. We're all about the success of the next generation. And we're going to make sure that they're here and we're here as well. That was a great answer, Ron. Does anybody else want to try and top that answer up? <laughs> well, it was a perfect answer. I love that. Um, and just a little bit more about that, just how um, you were saying, you know, don't be afraid to try new things. That's kind of something that my husband struggled a little bit when I first met him. He was he was just always, he always said, well, that's how my grandpa did it. That's how my dad did it. And he was willing, and I, since I didn't farm or anything, I would say, well, why? Why can't we try something like this or like this? How about raising hogs on dirt, like on grass or on pasture? And he was willing to try some. So I would say, um, yeah, just don't put your eggs in your basket. I'm going to add a little bit into that. I don't think I'm going to top what Ron just said, <laughs> but I'll add, uh, I completely agree with uh, what the other have said, you know, uh, diversify. That's, that's the way we need to go now. Uh, uh, something doesn't work and at least you have other way that you can improve and do something else. Uh, 
Uh, one thing I want to add, you know, we all know farm is capital intensive business. And I think that's, that's where you see most people cannot get in, especially the younger people. Uh, my, my, one thing I, I'm thinking we need to do to reverse what's going on now is uh, diversify, of course, and also, uh, uh, you know, take time, you know, start small and grow yourself up uh, as, you know, you start small, you learn and you improve uh, because, you know, time is free and it won't cost you that much. It won't cost you. Well, it costs you, but not as much. You put so much money into it. So take time, start small, and then invest uh, in things as you need as you grow up. Uh, you, in the process, you're gonna learn. You're gonna make mistakes, but when you start small, that gives you time to learn and improve. And uh, the third, like they say, think outside the box. You know, don't worry. Go to the farmers market and talk to people, and uh, get their feedbacks and what they want and and try to learn from there. Definitely. One of, the, the, one of the things we really wanted to do when we started our farm before Nyman was, um, my wife and I are really passionate about helping rural communities stay vibrant. Um, where I came from, just the small towns are just, just wasting away. It's in West Central Illinois. And, and uh, where I came from was the poor capital of the world at one time. And, and, uh, and everybody raised hogs outside. There's a style of farrowing house that Ron's probably heard of called a Pike County hut that, that was from where I was from. And, um, and once the pork uh, market sort of consolidated and it just devastated these small towns and what little feed mills or little restaurants anymore because people just had to get out of hogs. And, and uh, so when I started uh, our operation uh, before Nyman, uh, you know, we're, we're raising hogs and selling for a premium. And, and my dad just said, well, you can do that because you live by the city, but, but out here we can't, can't sell $10 bacon. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but once we started with nine and I said, yeah, they have a field agent in West central Illinois. And, and uh, he, he still was a little skeptical. And, and until I showed him my, my first, um, uh, settlement report, which is basically the receipt of hogs. And, and I have three brothers and, and none of us stayed home on, on the farm. And, and he just said, God, I wish I would have known about something like this. You know, when you guys were, were trying to come back to the farm and it just, when someone has is just, you know, strictly row crop, it, it's hard to find room for kids to stay on the farm. And that's what these rural communities need are for people just, just, just to stay. And, uh, so, you know, when you have something like Nyman that can provide a, an income stream or be a different enterprise that those kids can, can stay home and start, I, I think that that's really what we need. You know, it, uh, it would be, I, th I think, it just like, like Joel said, low startup costs, um, you know, low capital, uh, lots of support. So the learning curve is not quite 90 degrees and, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, what what Nyman does is put you know a lot of people you know want to start a small farm and but you have to find customers and and find people if you're small you kind of you have to charge a premium um, and what Nyman does is where they already have those customers and and so it'll work you know I. I don't know exactly what the, the radius is of, of hog farmers in the Midwest, but I've seen people from uh, the Ozarks and, and seen people from, I think, Wisconsin and, and Michigan. So there's a bit, pretty big footprint there that, that uh, we can make an impact and, and get some livestock back on the land and get these enterprises diversified and, and keep these farm kids at home. Absolutely. Well, I am going to open it up now. We've got some fantastic questions that have come in through our chat function here from some of our audience members that are watching. And I want to open it up with this one. I think it's a fun one. We've been talking about some serious stuff here. So let's open it up with a fun question. We got a question in here that said, why and how did you pick your farm name? Joel, I think yours is, is it Free Happy Farm? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so that's... Okay. Uh, so I, at that time, I used to sell, you know, poultry, eggs, and uh, broilers, and I sell pigs at the farmer's market mainly. And I start selling wholesale. So uh, uh, my friend, uh, Trevor, uh, I rent land from his dad, Jim, 
And so he, they have a farm store in, on their farm. And they say, yeah, you know, we saw some stuff. You can put your eggs in here. But then he said, well, you might want to put your name there. And I said, well, I don't want to put Joel's eggs there <laughs> <laughs> or, or something else. So he said, you know, hey, you, 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 he said, you, 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 your chickens are free, you know, free range, right? I said, yeah. So, and they're happy. So, and they, and they say, oh, you know, yeah, I got it. We'll call it Free Happy Farm, Free Happy. So I put their Free Happy Farm. That was supposed to be a temporary name because, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he was joking. He said, you know, people might think they're free, you know. And so, so I put on my egg cartons, I put free happy farm and I start selling that to in, in his store and also the farmer's market, free happy farm. When I, when I start going to hy putting eggs in our local hy and the other store free happy, and, and people at the farmer's always, Oh, I like that name. And then, and then just stayed and I just kept it. <laughs> I guess I'll keep it. <laughs> 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 but it was, it was just temporary thing is supposed to be here. Just at that time when, when I just decided to keep it, yeah. What are some of your other farm names? My other farm names? Yeah, or David, what are, what are some of your, what's oh. your farm's name? Our farm is Pastavina Acres and uh, Pastavina is the Czech word for pasture. And so my wife and I lived in the Czech Republic for, for three years and that was where we sort of dreamed and got the inspiration from the local farmer's market there to start a farm. And, and uh, so one of our friends said, we should give it a Czech name and, and Czech is a Slavic language. And so looking up, they, <laughs> there's a lot of words that are very hard to pronounce that have hot checks and, and things on top that uh, wouldn't make sense. But so I was just sort of going through, through uh, some of the words I knew and then uh, I settled on pasture and, and uh, I thought, Pasadena, that's not too hard to say. And, and a lot of people still mispronounce it, but that's okay. We're, we uh, we have the truck with the pig on the side that drives around town, and so they know us from that. So if they don't know how to pronounce the name, it's okay. <laughs> that's a really neat story too, Ron or, or Leslie. Do you guys have a an interesting name about or an interesting story about how you named your farm? Tell uh, yours, Leslie. Well, we chose AC Squared Farms because it's our kids' initials. Um, there's tons and tons of Christensen farms. So we just went with something hopefully easy. And well, it's our kids' initials. So we'd remember that. Ron, what about you? Mine is, is uh, it's just A-frame acres. And it's kind of hard to imagine it now. But at one time, there were 432 little A-frames on that farm and one day I just came over the hill with dad and the, and the old pickup and he says good god Ronnie there's nothing but A-frames for acres so that's how we got the name <laughs> A-frame acres. Oh, that's fun that's really fun I think um, consumers you know relate really well when we have those personal stories and connections to share with them and I think that leads nicely here to another question which might be our last as we're running close to out of time here but we got a good question that said, how can we help more urban consumers learn about farming and agriculture and the differences between Nyman, what Nyman Ranch does and what those folks in more of like the mainstream monoculture agriculture do? Leslie, what do you think? Well, we share a lot on social media. We really do. All our, all our stories are pushed out there. Um, and so I think maybe sharing that and telling other people about Nyman Ranch and how we are raising our hogs is word of mouth is perfect. I, it, it's the best, I think. Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, <clears throat> I post some pictures and videos of my pigs and you know, I have sows and things on the Facebook. And, I, and uh, when I go to the farmer's market, for example, you know, I get feedback. Oh, I, I saw your video. I really like the way you do yours. That's really great. And then that's how. So transparency, the people really want that now. Transparency is really important. You know, most of the other farmer, they have the closed doors and everything. You don't know what's going on. And then people can drive where I live and they can see what's going on. And I also, with the Facebook page, with posting that, that gives people the confidence, you know, oh, I know what I'm buying and this is how they do it. So I feel like I keep, keep doing that. That's, that's really important, yeah. Yeah, transparency, 100%. Yep. 
I, I would add to that. I mean, I, I like the idea of, of educating people. I, I'm, I've never been one to pick a fight with somebody over the way you do things is wrong and the way I do things is right. But if we can hammer down the fact, if we can hammer down the strengths of the way we do things, if we can hammer down the animal welfare benefits, if we can hammer down how important we are to the survival of our farmers, if we can hammer down how important we are to the survival of our communities, we have made a huge, huge, huge inroad into what we need to do. Uh, transparency is a must. The minute you put up a wall, people begin to wonder what's behind that wall. So don't be afraid to, to visit with people, even even on those 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 touchy uh, ginger subjects. You know, don't be afraid to be open. Don't be afraid to to share with them. I mean, every one of us here today has has probably got one or two painful memories. But you find me a job where you don't have one or two times when you stubbed your toe. But but the point is, don't hide those. Keep everything out in the open and be as transparent as you can with those folks. Yeah, absolutely. I think people respond well to that transparency that you all share through the Nyman Ranch system, but we're getting close on time here. So I wanted to end with one final question. We've talked a lot about it, but you know, to summarize, farming is not an easy job. It's not a nine to five job where you just get to go into the office, do your work and leave for the day. I mean, it's literally at home with you, but what what keeps you going? What keeps you getting up day after day and coming back to the farm, coming back to raising your families there? Leslie, I'll start with you. Well, it's definitely the joy that we get when we see what we've done. So like harvesting or like finally getting the pigs to the market and um, I, I, that's part of it for me. Plus all my family enjoys it. So I, I, it brings me joy to see them also enjoying it. Definitely. David, what about you? I guess, uh, anytime I have a rough day, I figure the, I'm the, the fifth generation uh, in the U S to raise hogs, not on our specific farm, but but uh, I just think about the, the family that came before me and, and sort of how easy I have it now. I have low impedance electric fencing and a cab tractor and, and uh, um, you know, water lines. I don't have to haul water and, and uh, just, you know, how, you know, for over 100 years that, that uh, you know, they – they had horses and, and scooped everything, you know, anything, any sort of grain or manure that was moved was scooped. There were no augers or anything like that. And so, so uh, any, anytime things get rough, I think, well, it could definitely get, definitely get tougher. And, and uh, I sort of just, when you have that heritage in your blood, you sort of want to honor, honor that by doing the best job you can. And, and, and then also just one of my favorite things is just the, feeding people and, and knowing that that our product is, is going out there and um, that people are appreciating it as a premium product and that chefs are doing really cool things and and uh, so it just uh, yeah it just when it's just and you know there's an end you're going to put the hogs on the truck or you're going to harvest that corn kind of like Leslie said just getting to that finish line and in, in farming it's not a immediate gratification you know it, it's it takes several months to raise a corn crop and several months to to bring hogs to market and so you just you just know it's going to be a long slog a lot of times and and uh you enjoy when things go right and 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 know know that uh there's always always better days ahead i guess is, is kind of a farming mantra <laughs> Definitely. Always better days ahead. Ron and Joel, before we end here, your quick thoughts, what keeps you going? What keeps you up in the mornings or gets you up in the mornings? You want to go, Joel? Yeah, yeah. Well, what keeps 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 me going, I'll say, you know, uh, my customer, you know, and also uh, just knowing that I'm doing something good, uh, raising those animals healthy, that when I go in the morning, I go look at them, they're very, you can see they're where they need to be and they're happy. And also uh, having a customer like Neiman Ranch and also my customer locally, the feedback that I get from them, uh, uh, 
uh, about what I do. That really encourages and motivates me to keep doing what I do. Uh, uh, what I love about agriculture is just the opportunity, you know, to raise the healthy animal, not just for myself, and also share that with my community and everybody else. So, uh, yeah, that's what I really like about agriculture. Just to, you know, I, I know I have my own healthy food for home use and also for other people. What what keeps me going is that that I think. In, in our own way, we are probably one of the last pillars of the true American dream. We can uh, succeed on our own and we can fail on our own. And what keeps me going when I get up in the morning is the decisions I make or the actions I take today will benefit myself and my family or they will drag myself and my family down. And to me, that is a tremendous motivator. But I'm also motivated by the fact that, that, that uh, like David alluded to, we are feeding the world. We're taking raw elements and we're turning them into valuable and viable nutrition. And, and it's like Leslie said, we have the end in sight lots of times. We have the harvest in the fall, we sell the pigs to town, we sell the cattle to town. And, and the beauty of agriculture is it's a cyclical market. I mean, we all live and, and march to the beat of the seasons. And we know with every coming year, there's a new chance for a better opportunity. There's a new chance for something different and, and something more exciting. It's just the little things like that that keep me going. Definitely. Well, unfortunately, we're at that time where we've got to start wrapping things up. But thank you all to all of you for joining us as panelists. And thank you to the audience for sending us your questions. I know we didn't get to cover all of them, but hopefully we've shined some light on the Nyman Ranch system and, and really the lives of, of these farmers involved with this panel. But as I mentioned, we do have two more remaining events that are open to the public that wrap up this six week event series. Tonight at 8.30 Central Standard Time, Dr. Temple Grandin will be talking about animal, animal welfare and how we can build a more resilient food system. And then tomorrow, Tomorrow, our very own Ron Martisan will be doing a virtual tour of four different Nyman Ranch farms. Again, you can visit nymanranchhfad.com for more information and to register again. So thank you once again to all of you for joining us on the panel and thank you all for tuning in virtually to this year's Farmer Panel event.